We're going to continue with our next session. I'd like to introduce the panelists as well as your moderator, Chris Tribby. Chris is a technology editor for Broadcasting and Cable. We have an exciting panel on talent and content in the digital age. Chris, come on up. Thank you guys for uh, sticking around. We appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this uh, this uh, uh, this panel is going to dive uh, dive into the, the data end of things. Uh, uh, we've got so much consumer information coming in nowadays, thanks to digital. What are we doing with it? How are we creating? Uh, how are we distributing? How's how's it inform how is it uh, informing our decisions? That's uh, that's what we're going to try and tackle. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to have uh, all our panelists uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their companies, if they like. Uh, starting with you, Bill. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, my name is Bill Bost. I'm VP of Development at Skydance Television. Um, Skydance Television is part of Skydance Media. Um, the feature side, we do films such as Star Trek, Mission Impossible, World War Z, fairly large uh, tentpole films. But on the TV division, we have a, a different footprint. Um, we are a studio, so we deficit finance our shows, we buy pitches, pay for development. Um, but we're also your executive producer. So we like to keep the room small and hopefully uh, provide a creative environment for our, our, uh, our showrunners. Yeah, no pressure, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I'm Mike. I'm the CEO of Cut, uh, most known for a video where I got a bunch of grandmas high. So thank you. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Hi, I'm Bonnie Pan. I'm the president of Endemol Shine Beyond USA. It is the digital division of Endemol Shine um, in the U.S. You know us for your tel favorite television hits like The Biggest Loser, Real Housewives of Atlanta, Fear Factor, etc. Our purview in the digital world is to bring formats and stories to life uh, to audiences on different devices. Uh, I'm Daniel Tibbetts. I'm the president and general manager of El Rey Network. It's a cable network started by Robert Rodriguez a few years ago. We're in about 40 million households. Original programming on the network right now is Director's Chair, uh, Lucha Underground, and uh, From Dusk Until Dawn. I am there. I actually joined about six weeks ago. Uh, I was the Chief Content Officer of Machinima. I've really joined El Rey to bring this brand and Robert Rodriguez's vision to the digital landscape. Very good. Thank you, guys. Um, now, just general for anybody who wants to open it up, uh, you know, can you pinpoint a, a time that the data actually has influenced how you make something? Uh, I mean, maybe Michael could, could kick us off with that. Oh, boy. OK. Um, so my background is, is in internet marketing. We uh, cut actually started off as the video department within an internet marketing company that became a startup studio, and we became their first investment. Um, so metrics are hugely important to a company like that. And uh, the, th the, thing about, the thing about that is um, we were doing it wrong for a very long time. So uh, often what happens is people like to gather up as much data as they can and they look at things that are successful that they've done or things that other people that have done that have been successful and then they try to reverse engineer rubrics for, for virality around that. And all that really does when you do inductive reasoning is tell you what's, you know, how something was viral or how something maybe is viral right now. It doesn't tell you anything about how to make things to become viral later on. And that, uh, that's very, very different. And so a lot of what we're doing right now has to do with, um, I'm trying to see what, what I can say without making my data people angry. So uh, it's discovering new methods for helping to determine and predict the types of formats that can be successful online. So uh, right now, a lot of the stuff we're doing, even though it is informed by data, uh, ultimately doesn't uh, get finessed so much by it. Uh, the, the beauty of data is it's, it's uh, finding out audience reaction. And by the way, the, the reaction in this room about grandmothers getting high, that's got to be some show I develop in the future, because clearly <laughs> it's a hit. 
but that's that's the 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 point of view of programming today. You have to program from the audience up, right? The the idea that programmers can sit and decide what is on air I, it just doesn't make sense anymore. And that only way to really discover that is via data. And so, you know, from my background and and where I come from for the last 12, 13 years, has been 100% reliant on data. Uh, analytics to understand what a particular community is engaged in and work with them to provide the right content mix um, uh, in programming. And so I think it's it's extremely relevant what you, what you're saying, which is um, uh, how do you you know the the bridge of that becomes we know in digital you know th there's a lot more information that has been uh, available to us in linear. Um, from my perspective, I think it's been very limited. And so the ability to, to bring uh, what's happening in, in an engagement sense of your community and then try to program that in more of a traditional linear basis, that's the challenge, right? That's the challenge as I've been watching today as all the traditional media companies have been talking. It's how do they find that level of engagement with the consumer that digital networks like Machinima and Vice have found over the last eight years? Anything sure. Uh, one of the greatest things that we're experimenting with around the data side and digital right now is live programming. And I think that it's allowed us to be really nimble in a world that content development isn't typically super nimble, even in digital, while we're more nimble than, say, television, it is a little bit difficult to be like, oh, here were the ratings from two hours ago. Should we do more nail polish later or should we like cut an avocado? And it's really interesting as we start to see how quick we can change our minds and our programming and react to fans in real time and use that data to inform not only what we program live on Facebook is our primary platform that we're using for live testing right now, um, and to really see that engagement and not only does it inform the segment, it informs what happens the next day. And nobody's locked and loaded from like, oh my gosh, I wanted to do avocado. What are we gonna do now? I know you're more, you know, more looking at it through the creative lens, but uh, you know, any, any insights, any, any things you've learned? Well, I think for us and, and the way we go about navigating data uh, specifically towards content is what we know that there is uh, a massive diversity in audience and people are hungry um, to to see themselves reflected on screen and and so for us instead of drilling down on specific um, specific appetites it's more of a, of a, a global swing in that there absolutely is a, um, a moral imperative to have a diversity in story, diversity in population, race, gender, sexuality across the board. So that's, that's what we know from our data. Very good. Um, now, everyone in the room is probably aware that, you know, both Nielsen and Comscore have been, you know, duking it out on who can do better cross-platform measurement uh, for, the, for the good, you know, last six months. Uh, is this something that, that you guys find handy? Nowadays, is this something that, that uh, you know you can actually take and use and, and you know better inform your decision making, or is it more internal? Is it stuff that you guys take from the inside that that you know causes you know that, that actually causes change? Uh, for us, it. At End of All Shine Beyond, um, we really use mostly our internal data, and it's really a shift from thinking about where um, you think about how formats travel. We look at how audiences travel. We look at how does an audience work on YouTube versus Facebook, Instagram, etc. To the extent that you can get data from all of these different platforms, but we look at those trends internally and compare them because you can always. The data can tell any story you want. And for us, it's very much into how are we segmenting that into something that makes sense, either for creative development um, or, or future programming and reaching audiences and investing in, in different content on the right platforms. Excellent. Now, uh, you know, we've, all day today we've heard, uh, you know, people talk about millennials, uh, the, the generation everybody likes to sandbag a little bit, I guess. Uh, they are our biggest audience nowadays, though, especially in, in the over-the-top over top space. Um, do we pay more attention to the data we get from, from that audience compared to you know, our boomers? Uh, you know, is, is, are, they, are they the most important people that we're paying attention to today? 
So I'm probably the oldest millennial or the youngest Xer because I was born in 1980. Um, so yeah, I have a tendency to look at at millennials mainly because they're the most uh, active and engaged with the work that I do. Right. So one. Uh, one of the things we notice, for example, is when we create stuff um, that spreads online, it's not just about someone sharing it, but how they share it. And by that I mean, uh, you can just simply share something, or you could put one word, but um, what's exciting for us is when people share our work and they write like a paragraph about it, and then they do it over and over and over again, and that's very exciting. So um, yeah, I have a tendency to look to them because they're the most articulate about what they want. I think it's really dependent on the platform. So it really comes for, from a kind of development and programming standpoint, starting with the brand, right? What, what through the brand lens am I creating, period? And then it's a discussion about what distribution platform does it need to live on, right, from a demographic standpoint. Audience, you know, heavy audiences are, for television, are 35 plus today, right? That, the, that's who's watching TV. And so if I'm putting something on television, that's pretty much who it's targeted to. But if I'm dealing with any of the other more digital social platforms, it is the millennials. So I don't look at what I'm creating for television, how do I put that on digital? I'm looking at what am I creating period that represents my brand for that particular audience and platform. Well, and, and we'll stick with you, Daniel. You're, you, you know, as you mentioned, you were brought on, what, six, six weeks ago? Um, and the way you worded it earlier was to, to turn El Rey uh, into not just the, the, the uh, Rodriguez channel. Uh, it's uh, for those who don't know. It's uh, uh, El Rey Network is uh, the brainchild of uh, uh, filmmaker Robert Rod Rodriguez. And uh, uh, how are you going about that? I mean, are, is you know, six weeks in, I don't know if it's fair to, to ask if <laughs> if you made much progress yet. Huge progress. <laughs> Big changes. No. Um, so what attracted me to this network is the brand. It means something, right? El Rey has a meaning. It's a purpose. It, it, when, when people that know it, they say, I am El Rey. And so that's a, that's a great starting point, right? Um, and Robert's vision, his tone, his style, uh, what I'll say is his sense of cool, that's something that is very, very evident in the network. When people see it, they go, oh, that's a cool network, right? The program, oh, that's a really cool show. And so it's a, um, from a, from a programming position, it's how do I maintain that vision, that tone, that style of Robert, but broaden the network? And matter of fact, uh, Bill, you just said it. When you look at audience, right, today, total audience, and you talk about uh, multicultural audiences, what that really is is that's total audience. That's the makeup of, of America today. And, and so El Rey targeting, um, you know, total, total audience males, that's its point of view from a programming standpoint. So the good news about it is there's this canvas, right, that we get to play with because Robert's a maverick. I mean, he, he's innovated, um, you know, throughout his career, and that's the way he thinks about the network. We're not afraid to try something and fail because we're going to learn from it, we're going to iterate, and then we're going to try something else. Um, and so that's a really unique position to be in today because ultimately it reminds me very much of the old studio system, the Wassermans and the Tartikoffs of the past, who were able to take experiments, right, to try things out. They weren't afraid to fail. They weren't afraid to let something live long enough to find its footing and grow. Um, and I don't think that exists in a lot of companies today. They're, they're, you know, there's concern about you have to succeed quickly or kill it. And we're not of that mind frame. Um, and I think that really comes from Robert. Well, El Rey's always been Latino focused, Latino driven. Do, does how that segment of the population respond responds to the content? Does that just, does that drive what goes on? Uh, does that drive what hits the air? Yeah, I would say what what El Rey is really is again it's total audience. When you look at the makeup of the audience, um, it, it is very diverse. Yet the idea of what Robert has put in place and he's done it through all of his projects, you know, and he says this best. He says this best constantly, which is. You know, it's not about beating you over the head with the Latin stick, right? It's about creating programming for a, uh, um, uh, a large audience, right? Um, but the individuals you see in front of the camera, the individuals behind the camera, they're Latino. So Spy Kids is a great example. The family in Spy Kids is Latino, but it's not about a Latino family. It's about a unique, interesting family. Uh Bonnie, uh, uh, Enamal, you guys are, you know, not just here in the United States. You've got 
you're all over the place. I mean, uh, uh, UK, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and more to come. Uh, how do you track it all? You know, it's, it's not, you know, it can't be very simple. Yeah, it's an interesting moment, particularly as we look at how programs are being developed on different platforms and around the world. So we actually have the largest esports format in the world called Legends of Gaming. It started in the UK, um, and then it started being franchised and formatted around the globe, which is literally the DNA of our company, storytellers that turn the story into franchises in multiple languages. So then you start looking at the internet as a global audience, and that we're formatting it into these different territories in different languages and in many times different teams playing against each other. And what's been really interesting in terms of tra tracking and data, and I, I feel like it's like data, data, tomato, tomato. I'm, I feel like Same we should thing. do a... <laughs> um, so, but what's really interesting in tracking the data around the different formats is looking at where the audience is coming from for the different formats. And are we able to track someone that's watching Legends of Gaming in the US, in the UK, and Brazil, because gaming is one of the easiest things to be universal. And so as we look at how we're expanding and growing formats digitally, it's something that we're really watching in terms of how audience is traveling with formats where there are literally no walls. Does anything stand out in any of these you know, countries that, that's just completely night and day from how we view here in the US? What's really interesting uh, is in the smaller countries with a smaller footprint is so many of the creators literally all live in the city down the street from our studios. So it's a lot easier to say like, hey, why don't we all get together tomorrow and do a shoot because they're all in the same city. Um, and that's, I think, one thing that smaller countries have an advantage to where they're able to build that kind of heart center community in a, in a way that is a little bit more challenging with our large geographic area. Um, Michael, uh, you know, Cut.com's pure digital play, I mean, uh, uh, you know, Vimeo, YouTube, uh, 350 million views, I believe is the number you guys put out there. Uh, being purely digital, you're also, you know, going to get the most direct consumer feedback, like, right away. H has that ever changed how you go about doing things? Has ever, you know, gotten a a video on a normal series you, you know, gotten comments on a normal series you have, and then because of the response you got, you did it differently going forward. Yeah, actually, um, we, so we, we have a, uh, a bunch of different formats. Uh, we're the type of YouTube channel that actually d isn't personality focused. Everything that we do is about, can we create something that will be unique and uh, serve a general audience and could hit um, different verticals? So we're, we're experimenting with everything that we do. We did a, uh, a pilot for a show called, called Sexy Charades that involved, that had people like my parents in it, right? So I'm, I'm asking them questions like, what's your favorite sex position? Uh, which made Christmas very odd. But um, so we, ha we had a bunch of uh, different groups of people, um, married couples, um, um, you know, people, you know, mixed race couples, gay and lesbian couples, and uh, you know, we would shout out names to like bizarre positions, and then see how they would interpret it in in their own way. You know, uh, as a as a couple. Um, afterwards, we received a lot of really positive feedback, but um, one that really struck me was a comment uh, from a woman who goes, "I love everything that you guys do, uh, but this particular video." Uh, made me feel uncomfortable because the I feel like you had the lesbian couple do more risky things than the gay couple, and that that struck me uh, pretty hard because we're uh, you know Seattle. I mean we we do gr we have grunge, we have Death Cab for Cutie, and we have Macklemore. So we're all about sincerity, and you know we're talking about a company that was founded by mixed race people. We have uh, we have 20 employees, half of whom are women. We're like uh, every type of uh, gender and sexual orientation um, spectrum uh, is represented. And so we're very thoughtful about everything that we put out. And I responded to her and I go, I explained how it wasn't our intention and how none of those things were planned. Like, this is all raw as we're getting it from people, so this is just how they perform. But just because we don't intend for something to be exploitive doesn't mean it isn't, you know? And it was it was one of those moments where she, uh, her response was, uh, wow, I got a real response from somebody on YouTube. 
Um, and that's had a huge impact. So as we've continued to go out and do pieces where we're really exploring issues of diversity, um, we're constantly having an internal dialogue and, and then sharing it with uh, other groups of people to see how they perceive something. You know, like anytime you create a, a, any type of piece of work, you, it's, a, it's a game of communication, right? There's what you intend and then what they perceive and then uh, what's out of that is the actual content. And so that's, that's, the, that's the game we're trying to figure out right now. Oh, uh, Bill, you're, uh, you're, you're, I don't know if you want to call it primary or top show, uh, uh, Grace and Frankie. Yeah. Uh, it's on Netflix, uh, w which until they start showing ads isn't going to share their viewer data with anybody outside the building. Um, how do you measure? You know, how do you, you know, with a show like that, how do you, you know, how do you, I mean, you probably get right. a little more information than the rest of us can, but. Um, well, it, it's it, for Grace and Frankie specifically. Uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, Netflix has been an amazing partner for us. Um, we have another series at the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Um, start we start shooting in the fall. That's this big sci-fi um, epic. And with Grace and Frankie, season two released in May. And when season two went out, we were halfway through shooting season three. So for us, that's that's the sign of success. And what's liberating is that our showrunner and our fantastic writers and, and our great cast, they don't, they're not, no one is tied to Live Plus 3. No one's tied to Live Plus 7. So there is a creative freedom with that um, that is really liberating. Um, and our Marta Kaufman, Howard Morris, our showrunners, they love it. Um, as a studio, we're thrilled about it. Um, and Netflix is, it has been a fantastic partner. Okay. Compare that to say, you know, being on other platforms, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's difference? Well, what's the, the, the what's the difference that you've that, that you've seen? Well, Amazon's a that that that's a, a slightly tricky because they also live in that same. They're not they're not living and dying by Live Plus Three. Uh, we just as a as a company, we started last season um, playing in the broadcast pool. Um, we did participate in pilot uh, development cycle. We set a few things up. Um, and and I guess I guess the thrust of that is um, you're aware there is a very specific barometer of success when you have Live Plus Three, Live Plus Seven. You hope that your network is going to um, is going to allow the show to grow. The reality is um, it's so brutal and it's so tough, um, and the marketplace, as we all know, is so competitive right now. Um, so you don't have that opportunity. So really, you just have to be super selective about, um, in theory, uh, who you're selling to and who your partners are, and making sure that the show you're selling to a network is, in fact, the show the network wants to put on the air. Now, our, uh, our, our panel title has the word talent first, even though the, the entire description goes into data. But, but it's worth following up on. Uh, but you know, does data influence you know, who we recruit and who we hire and who we you know, put in front of the camera or even behind it? I'll go. Uh, <laughs> so yes, it does. I, I, I think it was so well said, Bill, what you just said, making sure that the show you make is the one that the network wants to air. Um, it, that really means so much because I think it goes to casting as well. Um, and finding, particularly in digital, oftentimes there's the back end of the, well, who has the biggest reach or the biggest channel or the big, and you're like, well, they might, they're not the right person for the project. And so where are we kind of actually finding the right person for the project with the proper reach across different channels that they want to leverage for um, kind of that organic marketing to really marry that project together. And so many times I've been in situations where we've been able to kind of shift an idea of who should be cast in a show because we look at other data metrics like, hey, you're just looking that they have 20 million subscribers on YouTube, but someone that might have half of that has a way more engaged audience or a higher like to dislike ratio. So there is definitely marrying the data, um, particularly in digital, with the format in a way that makes sense and using different metrics to have whoever's buying it understand and, and be excited about it. Yeah, specifically views per video, right, was the, the kind of the number one metric I would always look at. Because if I'm, if I'm working with a particular influencer, uh, you can pretty much, right, that's how you're going to base how many views you're going to get on the particular video you're working with them on. Not their 
subscriber base or views they get per month. That's not as relevant uh, in that standpoint. But to your point, it has made the casting process so much more difficult than ever before. You know, back when we didn't have all the, the, the digital uh, landscape of talent, it really came down to uh, you'd be in a casting session and somebody wouldn't get, you know, somebody would say, oh, that looks like my brother-in-law and I don't like my brother-in-law, so they wouldn't get cast. That happens a lot, <laughs> by the way. Um, hate to say it. Um, but uh, today it's exactly that, which is, well, is it the right person and do they have the right metrics? And now trying to tie those things together, that's complicated. Now, uh I don't know, I was going to make a, a great power comes great responsibility joke that doesn't really fit. Uh, uh, with all this data that we're getting, uh, do we have to be extra careful about consumer privacy? About, you know, we're dating all this, you know, uh, mining all this information from, that we're getting from digital outlets. Do we have to tread carefully about what we, you know, what we take from consumers? Or are they just so willing to give it up that, you know, hey, it's fair game? I think the, um, if I may, I, I think, so yes, I think we, we have to take that issue extremely serious, especially when um, we're putting together panels, right? So one of the things that we're doing at El Rey, and we had done this at Machinima as well, is put together a panel of the, the fans, right, the super fans, so that we can have that dialogue with them. The truth is you don't need to know specifically who they are to accomplish a lot of the, the data subsets that you're trying to get to. But the fact is, they do end up sharing a lot of information with you, and so it's critical that you have a level of trust with them, that it's not going to be used against them, right, in any form. So that way, if they want to say something negative, right, there, there's just a level of trust that they feel comfortable doing that, because you want that sense of honesty back from your, from your super fans. Very good. Um, you, uh, back over to Bill here for, uh, for Skydance, you've, you know, Skydance TV's been, what, three years now? Been around? Uh, three, three years. years. Yep. Um, during that time, has, has, you know, the information that you guys, you know, get from digital outlets and, and from consumers, d does that change, you know, how you go about things in terms of short form, long, long form, what outlets you put it on? Uh, you know, how, how are those things influenced? Well, I think, I think the most important thing is when, we are, when we're looking at a piece of development, and whether it's a pitch, a script, a book, something that we are incredibly passionate about bringing bringing to an audience. Um, the most important thing is taking it out and finding the right home. So if you're going to take a big, huge swing on a, a fantasy action adventure, you're going, there's a handful of networks that you're going to target to be able to execute the vision you want. Um, if it's a half hour comedy, then we've got a handful more opportunities, more outlets that we can take it to. So I, I don't know if this completely answers your question other than we we believe strongly that content drives where we where we take, whether it's long form, short form, miniseries, um, and frankly, cable versus broadcast versus streaming. We we don't we won't take a piece of talent and say they 100% must be uh, premium streaming. It's what what is the story we're looking to tell, and then we uh, push it out from there. Okay. Um, Michael. Um, uh, you know, as we mentioned before or earlier, your you know, uh, cut.com stuffs Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook now. Um, uh, does does everything go everywhere, or do you pick and choose? Do you, do you this goes on Vimeo, that goes over there? Um, I, I'm not. We're not one of those companies that feel like you have to be on every platform uh, unless you actually have something to say. So with YouTube, we actually have something to say. With Facebook, we're just playing on it right now. Like we're treating this Facebook Live as uh, really more for our internal culture and uh, you know get the team excited about it. Um, with Vimeo, that's really, uh, you know, th just the few pieces we put on there are really like things that belong on Vimeo. You know, like they're very aesthetic driven um, and that's just to share with them. But we're not, we're not the type of company that feels like the way you find success is by chasing every audience in all the places that they're in. It's better to have a strong and coherent editorial vision and then attract that audience to wherever you're living. So, And what, what is the appeal for, for Facebook Live? I mean, this is a you know, rel relatively new medium for us. Uh, I, love the, I love the instant engagement. So we, we actually have a, we have a piece that we're going to start doing actually on Tuesday. I'm going to talk about it anyways, even though it's a secret. Sorry, I'm going to talk about it. So my... <laughs> Uh, my, uh, so my brother has cancer, 
and he's he's dying, and uh, he's one of those guys who uh, refused to do anything about it. Like he was an interest as soon as he found out, it was incredibly treatable. So for over a year, he'd even tell anybody. He recently told uh, the family, and I told him, I, I go, I think there's three things you could do. You could fight it, you could uh, you know ignore it, or you could accept it and just do whatever the hell you want. I mean. Like if I knew that I had cancer, I might rob a bank just for fun, you know. I just to see what it felt like. So, um, and the, as we were talking with him, I uh, I realized that he was he, he didn't have an idea of what he wanted to do, and it was much easier for him just to wait and see what would happen. So I proposed the idea of going on Facebook Live and having a conversation with our audience and going, "Hey, what should Brian do? What should Brian?" And then let's just go and do it, and then let's put those videos on YouTube. And now Facebook can speak to YouTube, YouTube can speak to Facebook, and they're, you know, you're making content specifically for those two things. And in the meantime, you're gonna, you'll get something um, interesting, what we hope is, uh, you know, also powerful, so. Um, the panel took a dark Sorry. turn there. Sorry, <laughs> grandma funny. smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Daniel, uh, uh, when, when Rodriguez got uh, uh, El Rey off the ground, he, what was the quote here? Um, he called it a playground to redefine television. Uh, uh, now that you're on board, is this, you know, how are you going to help him, I guess, realize that vision? Uh, you know, what are you going to use? How are you going to do it? Yeah, I, so for me, it's um, uh, one, making sure that that vision, again, stays intact, as I said. Um, and the fact that, you know, the, the uniqueness of El Rey is that it's still an independent, um, but it has a great partner in Univision. So that gives us a really good opportunity to utilize the resources, uh, but still experiment. So one of the things that um, I'm bringing to the table is just my background in developing, producing innovative programming. And so how can I connect with, again, Robert's point of view and bring in a lot more originals? Uh, the network really since it's launched, I would say, has launched four originals, three of which are still on the air. So we need to up that. Uh, the other part of it, what I bring to the table, is my digital background, creating a lot of different programming for digital across a lot of different verticals. And that's something where we can really discover. And to your point, you're exactly right. It's, it's why, why are we going to create for a particular platform, and, and is it representative of our voice? And I'm not using digital as a way to experiment, right? It's not a lab. It's not a way for me to see if something works and try to put it on television. When I create for digital, I create because it's the right platform to engage the audience. And maybe it just lives there forever. And that's OK, right? Um, but that's, that's the point of view of programming from the brand and not uh, for other purposes. So I think that's the, the, the two areas. I mean, the short answer is bringing digital to the table in a way that is organic versus using it as a way to market the network and then to uh, really expanding our overall development um, in originals so that we can see and find what really engages with the audience it still comes back to at the end of the day what's the hit grandma smoking weed that's a hit <laughs> uh bonnie uh, uh and endemol has you know you go to endemol shines a, a home page and there's a there's a list of, I don't know if you call them social media or digital stars that, that, that you guys, uh, uh, you know, help carry the day. What's, what's different with them compared to what you do with, you know, a TV star? I mean, uh, uh, how, do, how do you manage them differently? How do you, how do you market them differently? The, the digital star is really so driven by community, in my experience. And um, I know authenticity is a word that we are all really familiar with but they really take to heart what their what their village was built on and as their channel started to grow when they found their niche around putting on makeup or showing you the best way to do a lip that they really feel an obligation to showing up and continuing that narrative they may want to evolve from that so that's why people start second channels third channels fourth channels um, but they really do feel an obligation to their audience in a way that I've really never seen. So because of that, when you are working with them in terms of development and creative, um, the audience actually plays a really 
big part in that because as you are crafting stories together and collaborating, they're very much at the table. They're not something that um, I've never really kind of come up with a format and then like plopped a digital person into it or cast them. It usually comes out of a conversation that we've been having or a lunch and, and they're kind of talking about something that they've like always dreamed about and then we try to figure out how we get it to come to life. Um, they are very collaborative and they are very sensitive to making sure that that they're delivering on this community that depends on them. And I think that there's a, a real honor in that. Uh, uh, Michael, you, you hit on this uh, early on that, uh, you know, studio executives make something go viral, you know, they find, find something to, to, to go viral for me and that it just never works that way. Um, but what have we learned when you do see something go viral? What do you, you know, how do you, pinpoint how it happened? How do you look at, uh, how do you track, you know, from beginning to end what happened? I mean, uh... Sure. I'm, um, so when, when I first started uh, in that internet marketing company, uh, I was coming from a place where I thought the word viral is just really obnoxious and, and predictive virality I just thought was like, uh, you know, an oxymoron. So <laughs> when, when uh, they, I had a marketing guy come in and he goes, uh, I, have, I have a connection to Lou Ferrigno, does anyone have any ideas? And I go, yeah. Uh, tight shot of the guy work, working out. Cut to a wide shot, he's uh, on a total gym, but it's in the middle of the woods. A lion yawns at his feet. He looks up at the camera, smiles way too big, um, flips it off and says, did you know that the fastest growing nail on your hand is on your middle finger? And then it, uh, smash cut to black, the more you Ferrigno, Falcon cried, dolphin laugh, panther growl, and I and I thought I was I thought I was joking, and then and then several weeks later I'm standing in the woods staring at Lou Ferrigno. He's got a pug and a baby bjorn, and he's feeding rainbow sprinkles to a taxidermy deer head, and I thought, oh, this is it. This must be what viral is. Uh, so that massively bombed. And things I learned from that are, at the time, it was uh, this belief that I was gathering features of virality, absurdity plus, you know. Um, uh, plus nostalgia, plus kind of like a self-aware deprecation equals Betty White over Chuck Norris. And uh, what I discovered was that it was like affected and aimless. And I think, you know, I'm seeing that again now when I look around, uh, except the difference is that uh, instead of absurdity, it's, it's, it's uh, attempts at authenticity. Instead of, instead of uh, uh, nostalgia, it's... Um, like an attempt at uh, inclusivity, but really it just comes off as insincere tokenism. And I'm seeing that all the time now. So um, things that we learned when we actually approach um, trying to create something that has the opportunity of spreading is by beginning with your brand, by beginning with like this is the type of thing that is real to us, and then going these are the things that we think can actually bring value, that uh, that changes everything. It's no longer a question of quantity versus quality. It's a question of does anyone give a shit about this? You know, it's like it's about value. So now, uh, uh, you know, with all these different outlets and different devices, uh, you know, you'd think we have everything we need, but do we? Uh, uh, are there sources of data out there that we haven't mined yet that we haven't, uh, you know, wrapped our heads around? A hundred percent. I mean, I, the the way technology is changing so quickly, there's new platforms every day. I often, um, I'm like fascinated by Spotify right now, partly because I watch my kids use it and I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to go from a playlist into a video serve to them because Spotify's, Spotify has so much data on them. And it's a completely different set of data, right? Because they have emotional data. They have like the, I broke up with my boyfriend playlist and the like, I want to go to sleep playlist. And you start to think about these ways that you can program to that, program to emotions in a really unique way. And that's just something that we all know and use. But what, what's next? What's behind that? I think that the sky's the limit. I think when it comes to data, we're, at least my company, we're hoarders. So it's just like, give me everything. And then you've, yeah, I'm going to try to parse it, try to figure out what stuff is actually useful. In the meantime, uh, the best success is not screwing up. So, so you know, don't, don't, take, don't take this data and then go down the wrong way. I'd rather just not, not, not lose. So. Now, uh, uh, you know, we're all, uh, everybody up here is in the content creation industry. Uh, uh, metadata and, and getting that information right at the beginning when we're creating the content. 
how how big of uh, of a job that is, is that for you guys today? I mean, how, uh, you know, making sure the the titles and the you know the the you know the locations, all that stuff is is included right from the outset. It's huge. I mean, for us, I have a great example. We have a show called Fear Factor that you probably all remember. Um, and so, what's interesting is we have a Fear Factor like YouTube channel clips. That's all it is. Clips of the television show, and we started to see that it was going like this with audience because the algorithm started favoring it on Google. And then someone was like, oh, well, what if we tweak the headline and made it more SEO friendly? And then it skyrocketed some more. Um, for discovery mechanism, I think it's really, really important. And the more that we understand how people are finding and discovering content and how the different technology works to pluck the piece out and serve more adjacent content to what you're watching, it's really important that we um, kind of name everything properly because otherwise no one's going to find it. Yeah, I, th I think it's uh, incredibly important to everything that we do. Um, that being said, there's also there's there's a little bit of a common sense factor, as in everyone is an incredible critic. As soon as they see something, they know whether they like it or not, right? But if you're if you're a creator and you're making things, suddenly you're incredibly precious with the things that you make, and you can't you can no longer tell whether or not something is good. If you can look at something and go, yes, that's a title I want to click. If that's or or uh, have a log line where it's clear what that conflict is, and you go, oh man, I really want to see it, then it's probably pretty good, you know. And it, so being not being oblique or obtuse with with like the actual titles, but being very clear, you know, grandma smoking weed for the first time. It's like that's it, and I'm, I'm there's that's not a clickbait title because I don't say and what happens next will surprise you because it, <laughs> you know, it's just it's very clear. It tells you exactly what you're gonna get. So. All right, well, we got time for a few questions. No grandmother smoking weed questions, please. Uh, uh, anybody? Michael, how do you go to market? How do you go to market? How do I go to market? Uh, like, how initially you got people to find you? Um, so, oh yeah, that, that's a great question. I mean, when we started, we had no data. I mean, we didn't exist as a company at all. Uh, so how do we actually get out there? Uh, well, my investors said that they would give me six months of runway to prove that I can make viral content. I said, give me a month. And then in a couple of weeks, we had some stuff, and it, it instantly went viral. And then we just consistently did it. For us, we actually don't pay for any advertising. We don't pay for any marketing for our work. Everything is organic reach. So um, I guess we just make things and then put it out there. <laughs> The existing broadcast yeah. content? No, no. I, I I see it as again creating a lot more original content um, from the point of view of the brand. So I'm a college professor, and I'm um, you know I, I teach aspiring content creators. I was wondering uh, what your recipe is, if you know what your tips are for content creators. I heard the title. Um, can be pretty compelling. So what, what are the types of uh, tips that you would give to aspiring content creators um, to be really good at what they do and to be able to monetize from it? From a digital, the, the question was what, would you, what tips would you give to um, college students? I think the biggest thing, at least in digital, is try something every single day. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to lose sleep over making sure that the frame is the right angle or you have everything totally planned out because that's also what makes, um, makes it feel really normal and authentic. And trying something every day and having that routine around what works, what doesn't work. Um, you also mentioned, I don't know if you had the mic at this point, but talking about making content that's global, that's something from Endemol we've seen where, particularly on Facebook, because so many people are, capt so many people are captioning their, their content now, it's so much easier for me to take Holland's content on a travel tour and English subtitle it. And so I think that is, that's actually a really good point. Um, in terms of aspiring content creators, but trying every single day and sharpening the knife every single day to keep 
keep seeing what works and what doesn't work and trying different platforms as well. My 75 year old mom just got on Snapchat, which makes me a little nervous, but um, I know I was like, she, can't, she doesn't even know how to text, but let's give it a go. Um, so, but I, I do think that there's also that willingness to be like, I don't know what this platform does, but I'm gonna try. Cause the more you look at how stories are being told and how people are engaging with them, the more information they'll have. So I, I actually have a lot of ideas if after, after, afterwards you want to talk about specific formats. Um, I think for, you know, like the obvious, like obvious things is that if you want to monetize a channel like on YouTube or something, then you should just start by picking a vertical and then going at it and doing it every single day. Um, you know, I, uh, I think if you take a look at like the if you want to have a million subscribers right this second, then you should adopt an outraged sort of like personality and just complain about other things that are happening on YouTube, and then it'll it'll instantly happen. I th I think like in some ways YouTube is almost anti-video. You know, it's almost like uh, morning zoo radio bits, and everyone's a radio personality and they just want to complain about stuff. So you could probably get a million subscribers just doing that. Um, other things I would look at mukbang. Where you just have people sitting there eating food, yeah. constantly all day long. I, I exactly, and I think it's going to be big over here. Like I can already feel it. So like I, th I would really encourage people to go and do that kind of thing. But other than that, um, make things that are instantly interesting. You know, like if it doesn't grab somebody within the first few seconds, then it's over. You know. So. All right. Well, that's about all the time we have. And uh, thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. You guys are great. Thank you.